All right. Well, thank you folks for uh, joining us today in July. This is our first uh, summer session. So uh, thank you for dealing with all the technical difficulties there. We'll clean, make sure they don't happen for next time. Um, so it looks like everyone has their um, names there. It's nice to see folks' names before we uh, jump into it. So if you want to share in the chat um, the traditional territory you're joining us from, that'd be great. And we're recording the session. We'll pause it when we're having our kind of personal conversations. Um, but we, we are going to record the beginning and then kind of our, we have a section on uh, diseases and pests and things that we'll want to share with folks later. So we will restart the recording for that part of the session. So Marcus and I um, are going to be leading the presentation today. Um, and we are presenting today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Lekwungen peoples, including the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. So you can let us know in the chat where you're joining us from today. So Marcus is the uh, Capital Region Community Animator and the Animator Team Lead at Farm to School, and I'm the Food Literacy Advisor. So we've been running the session since January and it goes until October, so. This is kind of a more casual summer session to see how things are going today. And Rowan, um, she is a farmer joining us from Prince George today, and she's on our staff, which we're so lucky to have her. And she farms when she's not uh, working with Farm to School BC. So she's going to just share some of her, you know, on the ground, technical, hands-on uh, knowledge about bugs and pests and see if she can offer any, uh, yeah any tidbits on how things are going and make sure everyone's school garden is growing well. So uh, Farm to School BC is a program that brings healthy, local, sustainable food into schools across British Columbia and provides students with hands-on learning opportunities that develop food literacy, all while strengthening the local food system and enhancing school and community connectedness. We are a program of the Public Health Association of BC and are supported by the province of British Columbia and Provincial Health Services Authority. We have hubs all over um, BC. So Rowan is joining us from the North Central region today. And Sonia is our animator in the interior in Kamloops. So this is our team. If you're kind of in an area, you can check on our website and connect with the animator in your hub. Um, these are a list of the school districts in the specific hubs. Uh, we don't need them for today, but just as kind of an FYI, if you haven't connected to the animator, we can check out um, what school district you're in. So what we're hoping to do for today, um, just a kind of casual check in, how are things going so far? Are you running into anything? Can we help you problem solve? Um, we just wanna know how folks are doing. And Marcus also prepared some uh, information on pests and any diseases to kind of keep an eye out. That's good to at least be aware of things that might come down, um, I wanna say come down the pipe, but might show up in the later uh, summer and things that you should watch out for for now and thinking about fall harvest and then we'll let you know about what's going on. So I will um, pause the recording right now and uh, yeah, we'll just do a bit of a check in here. Nice. Okay. So just had a few slides here um, to talk about some of the common uh, pests in the garden. We'll call them pests because they, they uh, damage our crops that we want to be all in nice shape and, and whatnot. So um, feel free to chime in on, uh, on any of your own uh, experiences of dealing with these um, and successes. Um, these are just kind of some pretty high level ways of it dealing with. So the ca white cabbage moth, this is typically one to keep an eye out for on your, your, you know, your brassicas, your kale and cabbages. Um, you'll see them flying around in the garden, uh, has that little white mo moth butterfly looking thing um, all over the place. And then when they are really doing the damage, it's when they're in their uh, caterpillar green form there on the right. Um, they hide out on the underside of the leaf a lot or along the lower base part of the plant. So they can be a bit tricky to find. Um, but uh, you can actually do considerable good, good uh, mitigation of their sort of damage just by simply getting in there and with your hands and pulling them off or, or smushing them. Um, so uh, 
Um, you know, one of the strategies I've heard, and please others feel free to jump in, is, is some people will talk about planting a little later in the season to avoid when the cabbage moss seems to be especially uh, prominent earlier in the spring. I've tried that. It did seem to work a little bit. Um, row covers is obviously a really great way to do it. That, that essentially, if, if you can uh, invest in that little bit of row cover and maybe isolate all your brassicas into one area, that's going to really work well if, if you're finding that the, the moth is, um, is uh, really doing a lot of damage. Um, some people will, you know, in smaller settings, will use some smell deterrents. So they'll plant different kinds of plants around. When I was looking up online to remind myself of what are some of the ways to deter these, uh, the, the list was long. So there's, there's a bunch out there. And then that's also great because it beautifies your garden, adds in a lot more pollinators. Um, when you start putting in different flowers. So, you know, obviously magnolia is one that is common because it's so stinky or, or, or nice, nice stinky, we should say. Um, Green marigolds? Are, yeah, marigolds are one. Yeah, they're really like a, a, a robust smell. They're also good for uh, deterring um, some of the pests that go after tomatoes and some of the peppers and stuff too. They, they're often used, you'll see them companion planted. Um, and, Rowan uh, listed a bunch in the chat here too. Oh, nice, yeah. Okay, Onion, we'll garlic, up. tomato, sage, tansy, mint, nasturtium, hemp, hyssop, rosemary. Yes, and those are all things that are fun to have in your garden. And emerant, uh, emerant apparently as emerant? well. Emerant oh. apparently as well. I'm not having much luck. The deer keep coming into my own garden and eating the emeralds, so they're not oh, no. much of a headway. But apparently that does help as well. Um, the other thing I'm just going to draw your attention while I've got the, the speaker, um, Linda Gilkerson's book, Natural Insect Weed and Disease Control for West Coast Gardens, is an excellent resource. Uh, Linda is an entomologist and uh, gives lectures on this to the master gardeners in Victoria. Um, excellent resource that covers all of the sort of the pests that you'll see in this area. And I'm just looking through her thing at the moment, and she says that red cabbage cultivars appear to be somewhat less attractive. Um, resulting in fewer eggs. So that's another point. And um, the other thing is, even though you may see the butterflies or the moths in the garden and the eggs on the leaves, there may not be much damage from caterpillars. And this is because yellow jackets, hornets and other wasps, as well as birds, eat a lot of the cabbage worms, especially later in the summer. So, mm. yeah. yeah. Nice. Sorry, Erin, what was the name of that book? Natural Disease... I'm not up on the screen. Um, it's by Linda Gilkerson, G-I-L-K-E-S-O-N. She's got a PhD in entomology, and it is called Natural Insect Weed and Disease Control, West Coast Gardening. And I believe she has self-published it. Um, this is a more of a coastal coastal guide, but I bet you it apply, could apply for yeah, more than just the coast. Yeah, she used to be on um, a forestry board, and she's got a, an excellent uh, sort of profile for her resume. Um, I know it's available at the um, HCP in Victoria, uh, the Horticultural College of the Pacific, and I'm sure um, it's available in other places. Well, here we go, Lind book sales and inquiries. I can give, um, I'll put it in the chat for her okay. web page for how to- Nice, Royan's uh, put in the uh, link to, it looks like the website there to, uh, or at least to see the book. So that's good. And then um, also a West Coast Seeds link there for weed and disease control. Okay. okay, great. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay, West Coast Seed sells it. So that's good for BC residents. And Lynette, take note. Um, West Coast Seeds <laughs> is a, a seed company that's uh, very um, popular, I guess you could say. And uh, they, they, they breed their seeds a lot and, and run a lot of trials that are specific to uh, a lot of like the coastal climates, but not exclusively. It's, it's, it's um, can, you know, lots of seeds are, are being grown that can be used in, in more interior regions too, which in BC, probably similar to what you'll see in uh, California, especially Northern, does get a lot colder, et cetera, um, and mountainous. So a um, couple spray uh, applications, uh, BT and neem oil are options. Although, you know, when you get into this, it's like um, you, you gotta really time these kinds of sprays um, you're not going to want to be doing this right before harvest and different things like that. If it rains, it basically tends to wash away a lot of that. So that's kind of getting more into that kind of method. And so I was yeah. going to, I was going to make a mention that I, I, there are especially problems on the, when they're young seedlings, um, when you're yeah. just growing them out and purple spreading broccoli seems to really be hit. Um, and they're very cryptic. They line up right along the stem. Like they right. are just, they're, they're just so Houdini. Or whatever, um, and um, and it seems to me that there's only one per plant, 
like they don't they don't out compete it like they so if you can get the one off the plant and and get it growing again then i think you're there so just yeah. the, the pick and smush yeah that's my yeah method. totally and that and back to kind of that row cover thing too um that's when it's crucial if you can keep that row cover in that first month when the plants are establishing and, and really going that's that's kind of the the most important part because yeah like like a little bit what aaron was saying it's like having one cabbage you know worm on there isn't gonna decimate your plant especially if it's already been in the ground for a month month and a half and is established and has you know six or more strong leaves or something but um you know a lot of a lot of this is more for when they're young or if you're trying to have a plant look really especially pretty like you're taking it to market or something like that that's when it might be a bigger deal so so aphids, um, everyone probably has had these in one shape or another. So just a few images of what they can look like here. Um, so they show up on many types of, of plants, uh, very common on basil, um, um, kale, especially in mid to late season. Once things really start heating up, they seem to really start showing up. Uh, also a lot, uh, um, in my own experiences, on new growth of fruit trees. Uh, I've had pear trees that just seem to get just obliterated by aphids. You also, you'll often um, notice them by you'll see in a lot of little ants out at the tips of your plants and, and stuff. That's kind of like the way that it draws your attention to them. Um, they're actually kind of like farming them uh, in, in a way. Uh, so they have that symbiotic relationship with them. Um, and yeah, they can really, really hurt, hurt your plant and, and, and pull a lot of the um, energy out of it and you'll see that a lot of the leaves will be shriveling um and so there's a bunch of different ways that that um that i know of um when you don't have a lot of, of plants like in particular uh when it's on your fruit trees or something one way that i've actually used is i will go through with a hose and spray off like tips of them and then maybe i'll apply like an insecticidal soap or or a neem oil to it but you can do quite a bit of um, manual um, work on these um, some people will uh, go as far as ordering ladybugs, which will love to eat the aphids, and so they'll introduce ladybugs into the garden. Uh, that can be, become costly, and it's and uh, I don't have like a lot of experience. I've seen it more in um, greenhouse productions, like and with uh, that and um, beneficial insects that uh, like the, the wasps and different things that will go after different insects. So. Um, yeah, does anybody else want to chime in on some of the battles they've had with aphids and or success? I know that um, uh, the ladybugs only will hang around as long as there's huge concentrations of them and then they'll just fly away and they won't really get rid of them all. And so they're, you know, it's rather an expensive endeavor to, to do it that way. Right. So, um, so a lot of greenhouses d don't necessarily use them because they, um, yeah, they just, they, they'll fly out the windows. That's, that's what Glanford Greenhouses told me. Okay. They do a lot of other integrated pest management with thrip and stuff, but not uh, ladybugs. Oh, I think you might have actually muted yourself, Aaron. You were off yeah, and then you went back <laughs> on. Yeah. A good spray was really effective. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that you need to repeat it because there's probably some eggs on the, on the spot. So go back a week later and give them another good spray. And usually with two or three sprays, you can get them under control but a fair amount of force on it. Just uh, sprinkling water on it won't do it. You need the, yeah. the get to really go at it. And that's probably the most effective way in, in the vegetable garden. Yeah, and watch out for, like I think I might've mentioned earlier, watch out for doing applications, like top applications the day before, or if it's gonna rain later that night, cause that's just gonna wash that right away. And, and so you're gonna wanna just do it basically again, so yeah. Okay. Click like grow in, put um, a link oh, in yeah. the, the, the buglady.ca. www. The buglady.ca. Rowan, do you want to speak to what that uh, resource is? Do you, are you? Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it's a, it's a business, a website that you can order all kinds of different beneficial insects for within your garden. And I've used them multiple times for um, aphids, but also spider mites is something that I seem to attract <laughs> to my cucumber plants every year. So yeah, they're, they've just always been really good, um, timely with, with what you order and they have quite a quite a lot of diversity and just knowledge there too. I've also just called in and chatted with them with some questions and they were really helpful. So I found yeah. them to be a good resource. 
Okay. So slugs, let's talk a little bit about these, these little guys. So I actually have a lot of problems with them with my lettuce out in my personal garden. And, um, and I was just, when I was making the slide, I was like, uh, like they don't bother me too much. I, I think the, they mostly bother me in just trying to clean off the lettuce and, and not end up eating them because um, there's so many tucked in there. But, uh, but I was re, re looking into it and they were like, yeah, you really want to water in the morning because they love to have those wet leaves. And I do a lot of evening water. It just seems to be like the only time that I can really get out to the garden. I know that's not the ideal time, but I was wondering why I was getting so many in this one part of my garden where I'm growing them. But in the other spot, where I only water in the morning because I have to water this other area, um, I don't get them. And so here, and uh, sure enough, the first thing it said is, you know, try watering in the morning because they like those damp atmospheres in the evening. So, um, so anyways, that's a, a little bit of a tip on those. Um, you can also get in there and manually pull them off as well. Um, uh, some people will use copper. It can be expensive to do this. So it's not like something you're gonna be wanting to put around a large space. Um, and, uh, for getting them off, I find that, uh, you know, if the damage is not the main issue, if it's just kind of putting holes in, but I, I just make sure to do heavy dunks in cold water and swishing around and they all end up falling off into the water, um, sprays are, I don't personally recommend it just because of lettuce uh, being something that absorbs a little bit more from what I've heard. Um, does anybody else want to talk about their experience? I just mostly showed these little teeny slugs, which I find to be the ones that are really persistent and annoying in my lettuce. I, I think we had a lot more damage last year um, at our school and I'm not really sure why. Uh, we did have kids vigilantly collecting slugs. We call it slugging and they uh, use tongs or gloves and, and they, we have a swimming pool because we give them swimming lessons. And if you add a little soap, they're particularly bad at swimming because otherwise they'll just crawl back out of the bucket. And we talk about that in the forest, I would never harm a slug because they're really good decomposers. Like they have a useful role, just not eating our food. Um, so, you know, but I don't, it wasn't as maybe because we were so good at it last year, we didn't have quite the problem this year. Like we had some really big ones in the past. And then this year we've just had some really tiny ones. So that's kind of nice. And it wasn't like there was lack of moisture. So I'm not sure why. Yeah. Maybe word spread about those swimming lessons. <laughs> That's a cute way to put it. I like that you're just like, you know what, slugging, it's like a thing and here's tongs and like you make it kind of fun. Like I always, I can't believe when you give the kids like those litter garbage picker uppers, you know, and they're like, they'll pick up garbage all day. Like, no, you just need a fun tool, so. Aaron or, or Rowan, is there any other kind of ways that you can kind of keep slugs back or is it just sort of the ones we spoke to? Is there any other secrets? Um, keep your mulches away from the seedlings until the plants are well established. So uh, mulch a little bit later because um, if, if there's mulch around it, that will bring in, they want to go into a, a dark, moist area. So they will actually stay in the mulch. That's where they'll hide out. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the beer process. Are you familiar with that one? Which one? The beer process. They'll, they'll go for the alcohol. You put a sour cream container, uh, bury it almost to the top, take a little oh, yeah. sniffing out of it and put about an inch worth of beer in there and they crawl in and, and uh, get drunk and can't get out again. And yes, that's true. That does work. I have seen that be very successful, like a buried, uh, a little buried um, receptacle with a little bit of beer in it and they'll just drop in. That's true. That is a good one. I've seen that work. It's actually not the beer, the, the alcohol, they're attracted to the yeast. And yeah, so you can actually not waste beer and just buy a, a beer, <laughs> have old yeast or yeast and then you just put and mix a little soap in there so they have the swimming lesson you know dying thing you know uh mm -hmm. so yeah we we did that we set them all, a bunch up uh, lots of years ago and then then we got a lot of flies and they were all flying around and dying and it's like we it didn't it didn't have enough moisture in there it was a bit a bit yucky anyway mm -hmm. and snakes are excellent uh, uh slug predators so um the one that we do, like we collect our eggshells, like we rinse our eggshells and we collect our eggshells and then we like pulverize our eggshells for a couple minutes in the blender and apparently it causes like micro cuts on the body of slugs. So right. I some people put eggshells around, but here in Kamloops, it's so windy that like if you don't put the eggshells on at the right time, they just get blown away. Um, but yeah, we do eggshells. Right, yeah, that's yeah. another one that I've heard be successful. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the only other thing I was going to add is that they don't like like anything prickly. So if you create like a, a perimeter around essentially of even just using like, you know, fall in um, like spruce branches or something, anything that really will cause that discomfort for them to crawl over works pretty well. And it could be a fun little activity for the kiddos too to create a nice little looking <laughs> barrier mm-hmm. around the plant. Like fence. <laughs> So cucumber beetle, um, in, I haven't had a ton of experience on cucumber beetles uh, and have never personally been bo- super bothered by them in my, in my uh, gardening experience. Although back East, we would get them quite a bit in, uh, in Quebec and Ontario, but they typically will, you know, this is what they look like on the left there. They do a lot of actual, um, you know, skin and surface damage to the fruit when it grows. And you see this like little teeny, uh, holes along there. I know that row covers obviously are heavily used for growing squ- the squash crops to avoid these little guys. Um, in smaller settings, the yellow sticky traps that are often sold can can attract them and they'll get stuck on the side of them there. Um, so this would apply for like cucumber squash or you know, all those kinds of plants, zucchinis and whatnot. That's kind of what they mostly go after. Um, anyone want to, to add anything about how to kind of keep them away? Um, or have you had, do we, do you see much of this? I, I, when I was growing these, um, the past few years, I didn't actually see any cucumber beetles out here. It's not very common on the coast. Yeah. What about in the interior, Roanne? Is that a common one up in the north, cucumber beetle? No, I have okay. yet to ever run into them. Okay. Maybe we don't need to focus too much on this one then, but just a heads up, if you're starting to see this on your leaves, this is, uh, this is what it could be. All right, over to some more of the kind of disease and fungal world. This one is pretty common. I know everybody gets this more or less. So um, so powdery mildew, there's different kinds of versions of these mildew fungal kind of uh, uh, things out there. Um, uh, you'll see them usually on the squashes, especially late season squashes. Uh, it'll show up a lot and can be basically impossible to stop, I find, on the squashes, although it doesn't seem to heavily, heavily impact the production as long as you can keep it at bay until the later months. But we'll also get on the tomatoes uh, as well. Um, and so uh, some of the tips on for, for avoiding this is uh, making sure to keep the leaves dry, both of both of your uh, squash crops and your t- solanaceae and tomato crops. They don't want to be um, top down watered. They, you want, they want to be watered on the ground. Uh, lots of airflow, uh, direct sunlight, uh, is also all great. So that's kind of the, the problem that happens. Splashing of the soil um, too up onto the lower leaves of the tomato is usually the way that I understand that it gets passed on to the plants, uh, but it can be also passed upon if you have got a big uh, squash crop right next to your tomatoes and it's taking off with it, it'll, it'll jump onto your tomatoes too. Um, so one of the sprays that people will use is uh, the baking soda and soap blend, and then you'll apply it, but you've got to kind of do that almost as a preventative from what I understand. And then there's um, some more, uh, there's commercial products that essentially are, are sulfur based. Um, and essentially what you're trying to do is just create an atmosphere on the leaves that is not conducive to the growing. Um, I know that Aaron is on the call, probably knows a bit about this. So, if, and Ryan probably as well. Do you want to add anything about your experience with the mildews, the powdery mildews? The big thing with it is to keep the leaves dry as much as possible and avoid splashing. The other one that can apparently is useful is a milk and water mixture. Price is right. Um, One part milk to nine parts water. And you spray it on the leaves weekly. Um, But it's used more for inhibiting the germination of the species. So again, you would need to use that earlier. Uh, Linda Gilkerson actually says the baking baking soda spray to start spraying at the first sign of disease. So you can continue to use that one a little bit later, perhaps in the milk spray. Nice. Yeah. And feel free. I mean, with some of these plants, like if you've got a a lot of leaves and a really robust tomato plant, you're seeing it on the lower leaves. It's okay to remove some of those leaves too, if you think that that might help as well. Um, especially if those leaves are mostly in the underside of the plant, not capturing a whole lot of extra sunlight. But yeah, it seems like the big tip is keeping it dry. So sticking uh, on with tomatoes, I just wanted to speak to blossom end rot. It's something that pretty much all gardeners will come across. Um, And uh, so it can happen 
it, just to point out, it can also happen uh, just to early tomatoes, like the first tomato that's really trying to ripen. It can sometimes happen on that and it isn't always an indication that the rest of the plant is going to do that. I, I've seen that in my own growing um, and I don't know if that's just due to cold temperatures or maybe the access to nutrients early in the season. Maybe one of our, our, our more experienced growers can speak to that, but it's a sign of calcium deficiency. And so uh, you can apply, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Uh, but applying more of a high calcium fertilizer, um, calcium nitrate dissolved in water. I think people also will do milk dissolved in water and you're, you're wanting to apply it. You can both apply it in the ground and you can spritz it on the leaves apparently, which I had never done in the past because I was always trying to keep the leaves uh, dry. So um, yeah, you know, this is basically what it looks like here and it entirely ruins your tomato. So it's definitely one you want to get out ahead of. Um, any of our pro gardeners want to speak to experiences with blossom end rot? Uh, in terms of your issue about it occurring in the early stage, um, the plants may not be able to take it up fast enough through, through a growth spurt. So that's probably why when they're rapidly growing, um, you're getting it on the earlier ones. It can also, it's a calcium deficiency, but um, it, it can be affected if, if the watering is irregular and it may not be that there's not enough calcium in the soil, but the, the plant can, can't take up the calcium. So you, you see it in, especially in containers where the, you, you're alternating between hot and dry and then rainy weather. Um, and then, um, so even watering is key. And it also can be caused when excessive nitrogen fertilizer makes the plants grow too fast. So getting back to that, not being able to take it up um, appropriately. There are other things is that some varietals are more prone to it than others. So um, just a matter of selecting the type of tomatoes that um, are not susceptible to the blossom end off. And that's probably the, the most important thing. Yep, those are all good points. Great, let me just move this over here. Okay, so those are just the ones that I just wanted to touch on here. Um, obviously there's lots of things that can go on in our gardens. Um, so just a couple of things before I know we have, what are we looking at? About 11 minutes left in our session. Um, so just reminding uh, you, we talked about this at the previous one. We do have a summer maintenance guide that you can find at our website um, that uh, just helps with the upkeep of garden, reminds you of diff different tips. Um, yeah, and just keeping in mind um, the watering scheduling so this is really important. It's got brought up a couple of different times here. Um, and uh, with tomatoes, yeah, they, they like, they really like consistent watering. Um, so, but each plant has a different frequency and duration. And then again, there's always the challenge that some plants like to have that kind of top down watering, whereas others really prefer to have it on the ground and not touching the leaves. And so getting comfortable with knowing which of those um, what they like, you know, and, and for example, lettuces and things like that, you, you'll start to see more bolting of plants as we enter into this time of the year of uh, your lettuces, you know, probably by this point, your spinaches are, are uh, going to seed long ago, um, bok choys and all these kinds of things. But the more water you can get on those plants, both on their leaves to cool them down and in the ground will prolong uh, your ability to continue getting a multiple harvests off of it. So, and so, yeah, just a couple tips about you know, getting comfortable with understanding really like how far down is your water going and how long is it sticking around for? Because watering really, uh, you know, in one soil compared to another will have totally different results. I can water uh, two inches of water in a clay soil and it's still going to be moist uh, later in that day. Whereas if it's, um, you know, sandy soil, it's not. And so then I might be needing to water more than once a day because it, uh, it's porous and it's kind of dis dis disappearing down into the lower areas. I also mentioned something about watering, Marcus, really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, something that was, uh, someone, something someone told me in Kamloops, we've had a lot of thunderstorms lately and a lot of, a lot of rain. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm really just not watering as much. And someone actually was mentioning to me, um, like on a bigger scale farm or garden that they have, like there's great benefit to the rains, obviously, but like it's a little bit deceiving on actually how deep that water will penetrate. So um, I would also just offer like a general um, reminder to perhaps continue to do um, you know, an irrigation or a hand water, and it also like keeps you connected to seeing your garden, like as it's growing too, when you're like out there physically, whether hand watering or like checking on your irrigation. So, yeah. Thanks for that, Sonia.
Addie, do you want to maybe speak to a couple of the next couple slides uh, around just um, the planting dates, uh, maybe reminding of the, the harvest uh, calendar, and then we got a couple slides just on our next sessions. Yeah, um, I'm just writing a long um, thing for the chat. <clears throat> okay. So on our, um... <coughs> excuse me, got the big C yesterday. Um, our crop planning page, the first link on, on the chat there, there's lots of information about different things that you can plant uh, depending on where you are in the province. So um, Aaron and Laura Lynn and probably Lynette, you can all look at the um, coastal calendar and that'll give you an idea. We have kind of skewed the growing times to maximize harvest in the spring and the fall. Um, so you can check there when you would need to plant things and then what we, I mean, this year has been kind of weird. So, but you're both experienced growers. Um, so you can uh, play with the dates a little bit, but you can see the kind of crops that you could plant for the fall in the growing calendar, the crop planning chart, the second link in the, the chat there. And then we also have some fall crop cards. I think there's, Rowan, I think there's like 12, right? I don't know, we got a little excited about them. <laughs> um, maybe more of crops that you can plant in the summer to be ready in the fall. So that's the third link there in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, so you wanna be thinking about your capacity for the summer, how much you can maintain and water and weed and you know what kind of needs the crops have. Like maybe you don't wanna be planting carrots right now because they're gonna be really hard to, you know, keep wet and weed around them, et cetera, in July. Um, but thing, other crops would grow really well for, for fall harvest. So yeah, they're on our website there. That's one of the biggest challenges of those kind of, those crops you want to be ready for in the fall, especially anything that's like, you know, in that 60 day range or something uh, mm -hmm. is that, you know, to time that up to be in September or maybe let's say in early October, it means a like, July or early August planting. And that's one of the hardest times to plant in if you're not very present, you know, and watering frequently because uh, that crucial germination stage or a really hot day right when it germinates can wipe it out uh, in an afternoon, right? So that's the really hard thing about school gardens um, is just that compared to farms or home gardens is that somebody isn't like living right there, right? And that's always that's always the challenge, especially things like really like delicate things like uh, carrots and stuff like that, or or, or um, lettuce seeds and stuff. Um, did anybody have any questions about the fall planting? I think it was mentioned earlier, or, or any concerns about trying to line things up for a fall harvest? No. Okay. I'll move to the next slide then. So we, do you want to speak to the Saudi? Did you want to? Sorry, I was like, I, yeah, I don't remember who was going to do this. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I just felt like I was talking for a bunch. So I wanted to let you have a chance too. <laughs> okay, I was hacking up along. Um, our next check-in session is August 23rd. Um, we're doing the 10 a.m. time again. So if you want to join, that would be great. Um, and then our next ones in the fall are in September and October. So we'll go back to the third Tuesday of the month. So the first September one will be on the 20th of my birthday and October 18th. We'll be kind of cleaning up your garden, planning for next year, reflecting on how things were. So um, yeah, and we also might have another workshop in the fall with uh, Farm Folk City Folk, um, talking about some seed saving activities and things to do with your class, which will be really cool. So yeah, we're just kind of planning what that looks like right now. So we haven't set a date or anything yet, but that'll be really fun to do too. So again, feel free to reach out anytime um, to the animators. I think most folks are working in the summer. Um, oh, we have to update you, Sonia. Since Serena's left, that's fun. <laughs> Myself, but although it's fine. I like the photo. <laughs> and yeah, feel free to um, yeah, reach out directly to Marcus or I anytime or go on our website for uh, more resources. So, 
yeah, stay in touch. Okay.